A trooper is hiring for every position under the sun, data science, engineering, front end, back end, DevOps, uh, and business operations. Very brief, come talk to me afterwards. Uh, that's my 10 minute pitch. How many people came to the last talk I gave back in COVID? Awesome. I can use the same jokes again. <laughs> um, other thing, just so I can get the technical level of audience, how many people are engineers? All right. How many people are data scientists? A lot of you. All right, perfect. Monkey. Okay. A little bit about myself. Uh, as uh, Alice mentioned, my name is Kevin Novak. I work at Uber. Uh, I've been with the company a little over two and a half years, working as a data scientist. Uh, whatever that means in, in the startup team. But what that means at Uber, for example, is, is we're an engineering team. So I handle essentially all the engineering, which is a little bit too math heavy, science heavy for most of your engineers. Um, in addition to that, I do a little bit of data evangelism as a passion project. I like talking, I like sharing bad jokes, and I like kind of the audience listening to everything I have to say. Um, how many people here have not ridden an Uber before? Every time I come down here, the number of hands goes down. That tells me we're, we're doing a good job in marketing. So, how many people here have never even heard of you? We're doing a great job in marketing. Perfect. So, um, as most of you are aware, we are an on demand transportation service. We uh, essentially provide a smartphone platform to connect people with rides, including the South Bay, uh, and a variety of products. We've got SUVs all the way down to Priuses. In Paris, we do mother taxis. In India, we do rickshaws. Believe me, if they can get you from point A to point B, we're going to put it on a smartphone and make sure you can get it. Um, a little bit about the company. For those of you who aren't familiar, we started July 2010. Uh, officially incorporated about eight months later. Uh, we're currently in 65 cities on um, four continents, five continents. I mean, you can't even keep up. Um, but fully international, everywhere from Paris all the way to Tokyo and everywhere in between. Uh, got a global staff of about 650, a little over 100 developers. Uh, all based in San Francisco, just people like to see a little bit. A little bit about this talk. So Allison asked me to give a talk uh, about for the automotive group. Which, uh, I would definitely classify myself as more of an enthusiast about automotive technology, definitely a component and user of results of automotive technology, but not necessarily a tech car person in that sort of thing. So, um, what I really wanted to do is talk a little bit about ideas. And ideas does not mean I have graphs, I've got a few things that have never been shown before, so you guys can see something new, but um, this is not going to be the hardest of tech talks. Believe me, if you guys want to get into significant digits and programming, I can talk afterwards, but I'm going to keep a little bit higher level. Um, so a little bit, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the places where Uber's business, on-demand delivery service, on-demand transportation, overlaps with automotive technology, the future of a connected car, sort of where my world meets your world. Um, and I kind of wildly oversimplified it and split it up into two major application areas. One, how Uber can benefit from the next generation of sensor data. Um, and two, how we can benefit using the, co the connected car as a communication device or a platform to reach out to drivers. Um, talk a little bit about one of our products, bat matching, uh, correcting driver behavior, um, can only be data, or we be, I'm going to spell that, geosurg, um, driver positioning, and a little bit about vehicle financing at the very end. Um, so map matching. There's actually a wall of text which didn't come through here. This uh, screenshot of the Uber app, for those of you who haven't seen it, one of the interesting things that you would notice if this were live is that cars follow the road. <laughs> and so those of you who are familiar with GPS data know that this is not how you get your data. I wish it just told me the phone just said 1234 Main Street going north. Um, so what this is, this is a math process. This is a statistic process of taking raw, latitude, longitude, and converting it into a road. So essentially the way you do that is if you know a phone is continuously sending you information, that's free 
sort of time-based covariance. You know, if one, uh, for example, if this car here has one point in Euro Ferro Street, another point in Euro Ferro Street, they look, after five or six of these, it's fairly confident to say that they're on the Ferro Street. Uh, for those of you who are say that this is enough to fly the car here. Um, so I want to talk about, this is one of the projects, excuse me, one of the projects that we run as a data science team at Uber. Um, for those of you who are interested in how the algorithms work that actually exploit this, um, it uses a very heavily modified form of a Viterbi algorithm. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a graph traversal algorithm. They're all graph traversal algorithms. Um, but what it does is it essentially states what is the most likely state which would lead to this sequential series of observations on uh, sort of a st based statistical system. I say that five times fast. What that means is the highest level is we can GPS into the second as I was talking about. And one of the cool things for those of you who are engineers is it works both online and offline, basically through a set of uh, parameterized truncation or graph to So if you want to do it online, you don't consider as many potential routes to move graph. If you want to do it offline, you can just consider all of them. I'm happy to talk more about this afterwards. Where is you and Uber? Um, Obviously, in your client app, when you open the app, every time you see one of those cars move, you know that statistics in action. Uh, it's also used in toll assessment, but we especially care about what road you took, what lane of the bridge you were in, if you went through this tunnel or that tunnel. Anytime you kind of have to type that GPS information. Um, and we also run it as an experiment, small percentage experiment to fair calculation. Uh, only a small percentage because there are a few statistical uh, subtleties we throw out like actually assessing the right amount of time between these two points. We can kind of just arbitrarily stretch and shrink time in the interest of exponenting the action versus itself. Um, we found ways to unwind that a little bit, but right now it's pretty little. See, sure. See that the problem that you're encountering is the problem you're trying to solve. Other companies might have been trying to solve this problem. Is this a full in house developed application? Sure. Or are you so this is a third house applications. This is so this was developed fully in house. And part of the reason yeah, part of the reason why we wanted to do that was because at the very beginning it was highly specialized. All we wanted to do is stick a car on the road and drive on that. Um, in a sense we kind of started special and generalized. Um, the other process being that we couldn't quite find anybody's system we can integrate with our a tech stack as it existed at that time. So part of this scrappy startup, everything's kind of held together with duct tape and bailing wire. And, and as much as I would love to, to partner with third party system, we just didn't have the capability at the time. So it was a question of the data science resources and the problem to solve versus engineering resources and partnering with five. So this is an actual sequential feed of an actual Uber trip. Uh, as you imagine an Uber driver, uh, the way to explain this graph is that each one of those waypoints with a number is sort of a sequential state of the trip. So one would be a client requested, two disappeared is named on the map, three is the driver's location when he got the request, four is the driver's location when he accepted the request. The blue ones are five and six are where the trip started and ended. And this is an example of what I have to deal with as a data scientist. That's an actual trip going through Boston. Now, in reality, of course, the driver didn't go out in the Boston Harbor. Um, he actually went through the Massachusetts Turnpike Tunnel, which, while very obvious for a human being and sort of for a driver, right? this is what a Boston driver does every day, this could easily make a computer algorithm check. And, and you could filter out this specific example, but sort of dealing with a data set that, for the normal course of business, sort of results in these ridiculous, odd, wildly unpredictable errors. Um, it's sort of the bane of the existence of anybody who has to track anything using GPS. Um, especially when you don't have set knowledge of exactly where they're starting from and where they want to go. I just kind of have to track you wherever you go as an Uber person. So it's interesting. So this is the I graph. I'm a data scientist. Oh, this is the graph showing the error rate on the x-axis. Um, based on and the number of observations we did using 
I think this was you correlating this to Apple apps geocoding services. So essentially we were able to say um, a driver was notating I am at 706 Mission Street. This is what my phone is saying. Based on those errors, essentially reverse engineer how much error was taken in the GPS signal. There's a little bit of noise just based on sort of the natural size of the boxes that which Apple would call 706 Mission Street. But what you're noticing is the peak here is somewhere almost 10 meters apart. So we're talking about this on average, your GPS signal, at least in this is San Francisco, is about 30 feet off on average. Um, come back up to a thousand meters off or three thirty one hundred feet away. Um, and so what this is saying, if you read between the lines, is that cell phone GPS is kind of terrible to run a business office. Don't, don't <laughs> tell my boss that. But um, what I would love, and I think this is where where the automotive tech comes in, we're wrapping, we're driving around in this massive metal antenna. <laughs> that is very, very rapidly becoming a GPS-enabled device. But the, oh, the car has its own sense of where the location is. I mean, bare minimum, I would love that information to at least cross correlate, right? My two GPS devices agree. My two GPS devices don't agree. Um, but building on top of even leaving the realm of GPS, I mean, you've got little things like speed and rate of turn and very easy causal statistical inferences, which can help even giving a cell phone signal like this, which when you go underground, sort of goes wonky, uh, is a very straightforward statistical problem to just track uh, cars, delivery services, trucks, anything, anything with four wheels uh, with a great amount of accuracy. The connected car driver safety. Well, this is kind of the, the second point I was going to make. They were put to the GPS, so the idea that the swimming around there. Um, so, it was very interesting. I was trying to look at uh, accident rates, just straightforward number of accidents in a given geographic location. Um, and there were a lot of pieces of information about cars, about private pieces of vehicles. As soon as I got the taxis, I got people who were swearing to me the taxis were safer, the people who were swearing to me the taxis were less safe. So take everything, all these statistics that I'm giving you with a little bit of a grain of salt. This to me, I mean, between the lines, since there's a little bit of politics in these numbers, but this was the best numbers I could find for you. Um, some quick facts, um, and these are sad ones. Uh, talking about how safe drivers and pedestrians are. So nationwide, one and a half pedestrian fatalities for every 100,000 vehicle miles driven. In San Francisco, about 70% higher, 2.6. Um, and that just has to do with population density, that has to do with how San Francisco's drive. Some people hypothesize that this has to do with the hills, mm -hmm. you just have natural glide zones that you don't have in like Topeka. Sure. But that's 100,000 what? Sorry, 100,000 miles driven. So for every 100,000 vehicle miles. Um, in San Francisco alone in 2012, the most recent year I could get data over 900 <coughs> fatalities alone. Um, this is a scary business to be in. And even if you ignore the livery aspect and just literally think about people driving, yeah. Are you saying a typical car when it hits 100,000 miles has mowed down one and a half people? <laughs> no, so what I'm saying is the human race would be extinct if this number would be right. But some, something wrong with the number. Sure, I have to share my source of that. But anyway, <laughs> San Francisco. Nine hundred. According to the yes, according to the no, uh, sure. Is that you know what? Hey, uh, as a good scientist, I'm happy to admit when I'm wrong, and I will please I will uh, go through these numbers again after this. But um, these were the numbers sources I found. So I want to give you guys. A little bit of a demo uh, that shows how what Uber does right now, the platform that we have right now to give feedback to existing partners. So this is a little bit of a key part of the about how do we make Uber drivers better? Uh, and breaking every rule of good common sense on demoing your life. <laughs> See, I told you. 
It's okay if this link doesn't work, I have a few saved copies of Flutter Head. No? So this is just logging into our admin tool site. This is eight. He's a partner in San Francisco. Cool thing, we've got a lot of numbers for a very quantitative company, but what I wanted to share with you guys is this. So on every single driver and partner page, we have every time you enter text into that little text box at the end of your trip, we suss out all of these statistically relevant ones. For example, if you're always rating five stars and you rated this person a one star, that's a very statistically relevant number. If you always rate somebody three stars and you rate the next guy three stars, not a statistical, at least significant number. So, free information. Abe's been doing a little bit good, a little bit bad. Uh, this is one of these interesting data sets where, you know, even for drivers who might exhibit one or two just really bad drives, they can nail it 80% of the time. And this is sort of the problem that we have to deal with as well. It's a good problem to have, but it's a problem you have to do it as a, as a data scientist. Just trying to figure out, given a data set with two fives, a three, a two, and a one, you know, is he a good driver, a bad driver? Where does he kind of fit with this scale? Um, the other interesting aspect here, most common issues. So whenever you select poorly rate somebody, you select a you know, dial-in, one of those dial-downs, um, you start aggregating those. And so this is what Nadine would see. Um, partners can see this information for their drivers. So I run a business with 60 drivers. I can sort of cross-correlate all of my drivers into what massive feedback is. And then the other part I want to show you. Perfect. I was hoping it could get bigger on the screen. So we send these out to drivers every week. So this is your weekly summary. If you were to drive for Uber, I heard you applied, you'll be getting used soon. Um, you get something like this. And some of this is scheduling. For example, this is when you work. The blue hours would be when we expect you should be working more. Now they broke it in the street, excuse me. Pardon? Uh, it's just better people taking it to their church. Surprise. Yeah, exactly. Um, th this is all made up numbers. This is why I'm sharing it. But this is what it would look like. Trips you did versus last week versus average. Uh, let's see if it's on this one. So you can see acceptance rate, driver rating. Every metric that we want to give a driver feedback on. Sometimes that looks like how do you do business better uh, from a pure dollar and cent. When do you work? How much business you're doing? When you're working? Um, and some of that has to do with rating. That has to do with how do we figure out a convenient way to leverage good feedback or bad feedback to a driver and so do only give them the most relevant pieces of information. And the last page looks like this. Uh -huh. So what we do is we boil down to a single number above or below average. What we found is that a lot of drivers are very business savvy and they have a high EQ, right? They know they're good with emotions, they're good at sort of reading how customers work, but what it takes to be a good limo driver is sort of blend in the background. Um, but they're not math people. Percentiles, error bars, these sorts of things is just not kind of what you think about when you in, in a skill set which leverages as well as driving. So a lot of this is actually UX design and sort of behavior like it out of how do I how do I tell you something to get you to understand it better? Yeah. Quick question on A, um, the profile. It sure. Says that the, you have estimated or five minute and depending on 15 minutes late or whatever. Sure. And so what do you use to, to get an estimate of arriving time? How do you get a data? How do I estimate arrival time? So one of our products is an ETA, which is basically based on historical information uh, based on like on average trips between you know, the mission in Soma, Thursday at 4 p.m., take four minutes. That's sort of your offline component. Online component, Thursday at 4 p.m., trips are taking 10% longer based out in this corridor. 
based on sort of heavy traffic, a bus port cut, whatever it happens to be. Um, and then I follow an understanding of error bar. So, I, so if it's like if I have no confidence, I'm not going to ding you for you know, not being close to my horribly bad prediction. But if I have a reasonably good estimate that it shouldn't take you six minutes and it took you eight, that's the information I'm giving you to help you do your job. But yeah. So why are you getting the salt straight out of the test? Uber trip. Two and a half years, we probably got one of the single largest corpuses of traffic information. And I would argue that within six or eight months in any Uber market, there are some exceptions in, for example, in, in markets where we kind of have to deal with international traction, but definitely in the US, in six or eight months, we have a data set that rivals just about anything out there that we can use for historic information. So that's mostly for uh, local and uh, downtown area, or is it also including the high Oh, all over. I mean, we, people take, for example, in the Bay Area, there's enough Uber <coughs> traffic even going out to Tahoe that you can, I can predict within seven or eight minutes what your traffic time should be, with the exception of maybe President's Day, 4th of July, holiday weekend. But yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised that it's just the amount of volume you can get from, from trips. Anything else? Yeah? Don't you advise drivers on where to go pick up rides? We do. And that's actually, uh, that segues a little bit next point. But yes. Close this. Back to the presentation. So this is, was an interesting concept. Oh, and because of all the questions, I missed my crowning point. Um, so all of this information that we give drivers, if you noticed, it was post facto. What did somebody say about you after you got on the trip? How much business did you do at the end of the week? Right. What we want to do at Uber is go from being a reactive post facto uh, advising sort of role to a predictive, proactive, help you get better before you're even bad sort of aspect. And that's exactly what sensor that part of it is useful. I mean, all this information that you can just get off of a computer, uh, a, a car's onboard computer, how fast you're driving, are you consistently going above or below the speed limit, are you an aggressive breaker, an aggressive, you know, somebody who's stomps on the gas, which is bad for, for your car, right? Bad for your sort of bottom line is I run this car as a business. It's also bad as a service industry, right? If, if you've ridden in a San Francisco cab, you know what an aggressive driver feels like. And that's exactly what we're trying not to do. So all these pieces of, uh, of sensor information, which have a pure bottom line capitalistic business game, have a much softer service oriented livery, uh, livery industry game. Yeah. Uh, just a correction about the statistics. So it's 900 collisions, not the... 900 collisions? Yeah, yeah. The no, I wouldn't. 10 fatalities, actually. <laughs> just FYI. Yeah, 900 would be too much, because, you know, the whole city would be... be an I know, you've seen San Francisco, yeah? Anyway. <laughs> Let the record show what collision. My apologies to the audience. OBD. OBD? Okay. One's a rap star, one's a diagnostic for uh, <laughs> <laughs> Apology. Um, so again, as I was showing you why we're really on a radar, we need to tie drivers to phones to vehicles. That's a very common problem in a liquor service fleet management system. The secondary benefit, what I care about, what the data side of the team cares about, what our customer support team cares about, providing that rewarding safe driver behavior. Right? If we can figure out, statistically prove that you're a good driver, you should benefit from that. We want you giving our best customers. Right? This is a pure business model. It helps us out, it helps them out. And as I was mentioning, go from a reactive stance to a proactive stance. Driver positioning. This is the exact, yeah. What device do you use to connect the OBD port? So they asked me not to share that as well. But what I can say is we're leveraging a lot of the work that the OpenCV project was doing. Um, and our mobile team, that was an iPhone. We have a lot of Android devices. We just thought that was sort of the more natural progression. OpenCV, Ford product, Ford and Lincoln have a lot of similarities. Lincoln, Town Car, most common livery service. You kind of connect the dot. But yeah, uh, all of it was open source. Open XC, not open Did I say OpenC? Open XC, yes, the Ford project. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Driver position. So this is exactly your point. So. A lot of the stuff we were talking about, as far as working behavior, business analysis, was done offline. 
what we also have is a sort of secondary time frame. We want to help drivers get better in the next five or ten minutes. Where do you need to be? What street corner do you want to be at? What neighborhood do you need to be in in order to improve your sort of immediate take home pay? How do you do your business better? Um, these are a few uh, prototype sketches, sort of thoughts we had as far as how do you show information to drivers. Uh, on the left, obviously, icons on the map is simple, but what happens when you've got 50,000 cars on the road? What happens when uh, that dispersed section of icons becomes just a massive of a blob on the screen? You can move to something more continuous, like client activity by ETA. And in fact, this is some of our active research. We have heat maps, we've got several different sort of paradigms for customizing and adjusting driver behavior. But all of this is sort of, uh, it is indirectly beneficial to your business. For example, I'm telling you, go here, trust me on this, I'll help you make more money. Um, one of the interesting aspects that we discussed is geospatial search prices. So what happens if you add an economic aspect to driver uh, and client conditioning? Uh, what you're looking at on the left is not the best example, but it's the best one I could find. Um, for example, you could split New York City up into seven or eight regions, and we actually <coughs> have done this, we have an which will then surge those parts of town independently. So for example, there's no sense for you as a customer to pay more money to get picked up at SFO just because downtown San Francisco happens to be busy. Or in Palo Alto, just if we happen to surge all of San Francisco as one unit. In New York City, it's the same aspect. Downtown, midtown, very different market dynamics in Brooklyn, or Queens, or any of these other areas. So what we do is we actually create surge pricing, which is fair for the customer. On the flip side, when downtown gets busy, you incentivize the driver to head to downtown in a purely economic sense. Uh, this ruled out, in Boston today, we're in about the top 20% of Uber markets right now. So this is also actively undergoing, <coughs> actively undergoing development. So an interesting way of proving this, again, I need to show graphs. Look at ETA versus utilization. How much of our fleet is taken up versus how long does it take us to get to another customer? Uh, this is probably the best way that we can measure how drivers position themselves. And one of the most obvious ways, rather. Um, as we start to get busy, if drivers are well positioned, you're going to see drops in ETAs at higher business rates. But if we can get to more customers a quick, in a quicker way, when we have fewer cars available, ergo they must have been better positioned with respect to the van. It's a sort of convoluted argument, but the interesting aspect here is this is exactly what we observed with GeoSurge. So the blue line was pre GeoSurge. Black line was post you absurd. What you notice is that there is a decrease in demand, but only at high rates of utilization. You can sort of decrease demand by putting 100,000 cars on the road, but that would that would not only affect high business. That would just lower ETAs across the board. Does that make sense? It's an interesting way. One of the interesting aspects here is if we only had 10% of our fleet left, and we use GeoSurge, that gap there on that high axis is five minutes. So. Geosurging means that we're actually lowering the average pickup time across the city by five minutes. The 95th percentile is something like 18 minutes. What is driver throughput? Driver throughput. So that means, very impressive. Um, <coughs> essentially, what we're doing by inducing drivers to sit, basically moving the boats closer to the fishes, we can essentially get 5% more trips out of the same number of drivers. So, and this is just raw efficiency. If we took the same amount of stuff to get 5% more juice out. Yeah? So who owns the car? Who owns the car? Great question. Uber partners with existing livery service. So we do not own a single vehicle anywhere in the globe. What we do is, say you own a limo company, you've been doing kind of your traditional business for a long time. Um, what we can do is we provide you a platform, we partner with you, take a certain cut of every transaction to help you do your business. So essentially, and that's one of the interesting aspects here, is that I don't own any cars, I cannot force anybody to do anything. What I can do is incentivize, induce, beg, plead, cajole, show you, lead the horse to water, but I can't make you do anything. Uh, but that's exactly uh, one of the subtleties of what I'm going to do about two sides of the marketplace. 
So if, like, say, some taxi company already have a progressive the OPD2, sure. and then on that, can you put the full benefit to uh, implement all the features, or you still have to do something modification? So it would depend. So I would say most taxi companies, uh, I kind of circumvent that argument, but most taxi companies don't generally tend to want our advice. We'll just kind of run the business how they will. And almost every limo company, I would say 99.999% don't do OBD emissions check there. I mean, they will do one off, or they'll do offline process, but they certainly don't have an online continuously diagnostic, continuous feedback loop. Um, like we could potentially offer that on the Yeah? So, what kind of optimist in the business can a new driver expect when they sign with an Uber or what, like, what would make them a good candidate either from time working, location, whatever purpose that you can think of to get that? Sure. And that's kind of, um, so I'd say it would depend on the driver. And it would depend on, um, I was going to say, it depends on how well they listen to me, but that's not really smug and not what I meant. Um, we really, what we really want to be able to do is, instead of trying to take a driver and force him to do things exactly the Uber way, a lot of what we try and do, as I was talking about when you're messaging, is try and figure out how do you do business? Like, what, what's your sort of style? How can I help you do that just a little bit better? So for example, some drivers are income targeted for the labor economists in the room all, none of you. Um, income targeters are, I want to make $500 today and I'm going to go home, okay? Um, very common in the taxi industry, right? It's very fixed, I pay this amount, I want to make this much, I go home, and you want to it's a good salary. Um, if you want to work that way, what I can tell you is, well, if you instead of working eight hours today, just work three hours and just shift it later in the day. I'll meet you halfway. Do you, and I'll just tell you how to do it better. Some people are the opposite. I work six hours a day. I just I, I, and I want it to be the same every sort of day. How do I sort of take that business model and just using free information, free information from the Uber system? How can I help you work the best six hours you can in a day? So I would say it's really a mix of both. A lot of it also has to do with I run businesses that have traditional clients. I have a business that sort of extraneous factors to the Uber marketplace. So trying to force everyone in the lockstep is just not really a feasible business model. Yeah. You you explicitly classify drivers into one of one or many uh, personality types to uh, respond to in a particular way. Um, we have done some experiments on it. We haven't quite scaled it up yet, but that's definitely the direction we're heading. I mean, I wish that I could just automatically like personality tag every driver as they walk through the door. We haven't quite gotten there yet. I would say within again three to six months. We're looking for work. I mean, I can definitely. Yeah, but feel free to cut off questions too. Sure. <laughs> we're almost done. I swear. Right. So this is the obligatory self-driving car picture. I had to have one in here. Uh, the automotive technology overlap with cars is fairly obvious. I prefer, for all the total recall fans, I prefer the Johnny Cab analogy. Um, but essentially, this is kind of the holy grail of where the connected car meets the livery service. If, if I just had a fleet of, of 100,000 uh, self-driving semi-autonomous cars, I, I could solve the Uber equation in close form. Where it gets messy is the fact that our drivers are human beings. And that's frankly also a lot of our value proposition, right? A guy who knows the city can chat with you, those sorts of things. From a pure logistics perspective, I wish I could just order everyone around, right? And there's no, you sort of throw the incentivization problem outside the window, uh, outside the window, out the window. Um, and essentially all of this geo-serve spatial geo serve pricing, supply position, all these heat maps, just have to do with the fact that, like you said, we don't own cars. Um, and we just need to incentivize good behavior with our drivers. Um, outside of the actual totally autonomous car, the interesting aspect here is that as we get closer to that, uh, the vehicles themselves become platforms for Uber's message. Um, the interesting thing here, this is a finance deal or a finance, financial announcement from TechCrunch about 
a deal we did in late November to help drivers get cars by partnering with Toyota, GM. I think we said partnered with Honda. Essentially, we we'll help you get discounted vehicle leases if you're working a certain number of hours on the Uber system. Uh, it helps the financial companies lower risk because we know that they have a stable income and source of income. It helps us because we get more drivers who have cars on the road. And it helps us as engineers because we got to meet all of these teams and all their onboard platform teams. Um, I think there are some very interesting, as of not yet announced, uh, potential to put an Uber app or some part of it right into a car dashboard. These cars are running Linux, they're running Android. These are systems I know how to program in, I know how to build features for, I have features programmed and built for. Why not just put it right to the dashboard and throw out the phone entirely? Um, a very, I would probably rank these going to the presentation in um, feasible to least feasible, but definitely something we've been considering. I think this is a little bit more uh, one to two years out, depending on sort of how a self-driving car debate shapes up and how much more effort time money gets invested in the multimedia platform. This could be a very interesting potential <laughs> for us. Yeah? A quick question on that deal. So, so if I buy a Toyota and I use it for Uber, I get a discount for Toyota because of the sure. partnership we have with them. Sure. What the information are you sharing with Toyota as a result of that? Yeah, absolutely. So that's their yeah. Uh, essentially the way it works is say you bought a Camry and your lease payment is 300 bucks a month or whatever that happens to be. What you, you own that lease and what Uber does as part of the explicit agreement is if you've logged a certain, I don't remember if it's hours or trips, it kind of varies by city and product. You meet a certain criteria, Uber gives you an automatic discount. They pay a hundred dollars or whatever the percentage happens to be on that lease. So it's still your lease, you're still paying on it just like you would in the other car lease. You just sort of get a baked in discount as a thank you for Uber for sort of maintaining a business partnership with us. And then what does Toyota get? So Toyota, they get to lease you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of cameras <coughs> to an otherwise unmet market segment. But is Toyota also getting a bunch of information from you folks in terms no, of no, not at all. I can tell you as the keeper of the data, you know, nothing is going to Toyota. This is a purely financial Purely thing. financial thing. I have, we have an amazing biz dev team that are good friends with me. So, conclusion, high mind success. Cars on the lifeblood of Uber, obviously. As we're talking about the delivery service business, I think it's natural to sort of focus on customers, focus on, on how do people feel about your product. But at the end of the day, when the rubber meets the road, quite literally, we need cars on the road. We want drivers who work for Uber, who like working for Uber, we have a business that makes sense working for Uber. That's what we're about. Um, and as vehicle platforms become more and more integrated, more and more open, more and more instrumented, that just gets followed through benefits for drivers, for us, as sort of the middle way there for customers. Uh, if we can help drive drivers closer to customers, you guys benefit. I and mean, that's exactly what we're about. And that's exactly what I said. <laughs> Any questions? So, yeah. so I had a question about how do you communicate information? What I'm thinking about is people are use, drivers are using their phone. Sure. So how does that, how do you deal with the legality of an app? Yep, exactly. So uh, all of our, <coughs> from a purely engineering problem, trying to fit a lot of fairly complex information fairly intuitively into an iPhone screen, without a doubt, one of our single biggest issues. Uh, in certain marketplaces, mostly overseas, you can sort of mitigate that by like putting iPhone minis in a car or putting an Android tablet. In the United States, you're exactly right though. Um, and it's sort of, it's a bad solution because it, you're, you're, it's not safe. And it's not, and you know, you increase screen real estate, but you don't make them understand it any quicker. And that's exactly why we're interested in a lot of these onboard platforms. Right? They've already kind of figured out how to display a heck of a lot of information fairly intuitively to a customer. And sort of as you sort of build in these natural maps, navigation, once you sort of get beyond just like RPM speed, gas level, you know, they, they're, I think, if anything, they're ahead of us in figuring out how to integrate that well into a HUD. It's something we're very interested in leveraging. But yeah, exactly, a great point. Sure. Um, how much data are you processing? Um, any user feedback and all of that? Sure. Like, what, what are you talking about on a daily basis? 
on a daily basis. If I had to put numbers on it, and these are going to be this one, uh, probably tens of gigabytes. I would say maybe a little bit more. Uh, but it's, I think it's natural to sort of lump data science companies together with big data companies. Um, the fact of the matter is with Uber, um, we're not Facebook, and that's not how you use us, right? Uh, if, as you use any transportation platform, we're talking about single digit number of transactions in a week. Um, I hope it's double digits, thank you very much if it is, but on the order of five to 10 relatively high value transactions. I mean, this is not social impressions, this is not advertising click through rates. Um, where you do get a lot of information is from GPS and it's from driver phones. And sort of, we can, we can tell when they're on duty, when they're coming into work, when they're going off duty. That's where you really get to mine some interesting information. Uh, but the fact of the matter is it's all pretty spatial and uh, that in some ways can limit the amount of horsepower you have to do online stuff. I think, um, we can do a lot of what we've been doing when it comes to spatial work, um, purely data science driven is um, a lot of simplification offline. We'll just sort of generate maps um, and, and even, I guess you'd call them 4D maps, XY to XY maps of spatial information from this point in the mission to this point in the summer is about 12 minutes. That's your offline component done completely uh, through map reduce and sort of big data techniques. And then sort of correction factors based online. And we were talking, I've talked through this a little bit with ETAs, happy to talk some more <coughs> offline, but I think we're losing the rest of the crowd. Yeah? What are the, what are the key differences between Uber's kind of amateur taxi driver, sure. taxi cab driver, which I think, it's, I don't know if that's Uber X, but that business and say no. So Uber X, um, the technical term from the state of California is a TNA, a transportation network affiliate. Um, and Lyft is entirely peer-to-peer -peer driven, peer-to-peer uh, -peer -peer driver. So I have a car coming off the street. Um, there are a few major requirements as far as insurance, background checks, state mandated type stuff. Um, a little bit different when you get down into the details of it. Um, Uber, UberX itself is a combination of TNA, a TNA network, people coming off the street, and professional drivers who have what's called a TCP number. Um, and that's the same as you would get in the limo, uh, same as you would get uh, in actually most taxis, but in the limos you can see them on the dash or on the bumper. Um, and so you'll, you'll see Uber X's with those. And a lot of that is either guys where they want to scale up, they want to have a large fleet. For example, I want to run 20 Priuses instead of eight Cadillac Escalade. It's just how they like to run their business. Some of it is I'm a more, I'm growing my business. I bought one Prius with the 15 grand I had saved. I made another 15 grand and now I'm kind of scaling my business that way. Um, it's a combination of both. We really like it that way because um, it's good to have a mix of experience levels in your fleet, right? You can have got, they talk to each other, they're very social. Your professionals teach your amateur. Your amateurs become professionals. The professionals start buying town cars, they start so we have lots of guys who are like, oh, I had to move to Houston or I'm moving to Dallas, I want to drive to Dallas. And you get, it's, it's kind of cool to see, uh, as I was saying before, very non-technical, but sort of natural, <coughs> pre-technicality of just guys hanging out in taxi life. It's cool to see. So these, you're at your, you have, you do not have people off, off the street, kind of like this. We do. Have a any, car. Yep, and any, marketplace that will allow it for the legal regulation? Yes, we do. And so I think that's California, uh, both LA, Sacramento, and San Francisco. Uh, and I think they're trying it a trial basis in New Jersey as well. Uh, but we're kind of, we let the state take the lead on those sorts of things. For, for those kind of TNA business units, what is the difference between Uber and, and Lyft? Um, Either in terms of culture or cost? Or sure. Or um, the, Raw, and as far as, as money goes, uh, Uber X drivers will, will tend to make a little bit more. I'm a little bit biased, but I, I have fairly good intuition to back that up. Um, Lyft does a few things fairly interestingly as far as promoting community. We've been very much about putting the best possible product on the road. The product is inherently customer facing. I want, I want you to love my service. 
Lyft is a little bit more about like, I want my driver to love the service as much as we do. So it's a little bit different philosophy. Uh, we feel that our model scales a little bit better. Um, and then there's just natural company scale. Lyft's in eight or nine markets, we're in 65. So, um, so you know, we also get some big company benefits as well. Yeah, in the back. How many miles do your town car drivers typically do in a typical in your ship, whether it be maybe 24 hours? Sure. It varies pretty wildly, actually. I would say some guys, they like to circulate the city. Some guys pick a spot and camp out and will not move until we send them a ride. Um, the interesting thing that we actually found, you can kind of use that ETA versus utilization graph, um, is that optimal Uber utilization if you were like, if you were optimally efficient, you would spend 20% of your time open doing nothing, ideally not moving because you're not burning gas, 20% of your time on route to a customer, and 60% of your time on trip. Uh, which is, it makes a little bit more sense when you look at the map, and I can actually show you a few graphs if you want to dig into it. But 60% is sort of your optimal throughput of, of a given Uber system. And we can twiddle with that with supply positioning like I was talking about. Given that's kind of where we're at right now. So, so what is the average? Is, is there an average? Miles? If I quoted you an average here, or if it would be plus or minus several hundred. I would say the given average Uber trip is about 12 minutes, so call that four to five miles, and the average driver does three an hour. So I mean, 15 miles driven on trip in an hour is about <coughs> the average, but plus or minus 10. Yeah. Sure. So a couple of questions actually. Do passengers typically give reviews immediately or is it later? And then do you guys process it immediately? For example, you know, you just do a batch processing at the end of the day or do you do it immediately? And if a driver is, say, about five sequential bad reviews, do you actually process it soon enough to do some feedback? Yes. So there were several questions that I'll try to answer in order. Um, do we keep track of how long it takes a customer to ride, to rate a trip? Actually, that's actually one of the experiments we're running right now as we speak. We just found it up. There's some interesting hypotheses about, like, do you forget how good your Uber was? Like, I don't have to just fly and move on. Um, and if we get a handle on, like, if that's the case or, like, what sort of effect that is, we can feed that in, like, I'm showing with the partner page there. Talking about significant rating, that's a big part of it. Like, is this somebody just fly and forget about it? Or, or is this genuinely an amazing driver that we want to reward? Uh, so trying to get a handle on that as a function of sort of time since trip is, is area of current research. I'm trying to remember. Second question, do we, re do, do we respond immediately or sort of aggregate? Um, combination of both. So if there is a, we have a few, we have a system which sifts out immediately actionable problems. Um, those sound like things like car accidents, uh, somebody like puked in the back of a car, there was some sort of Aspect. Uh, there are a few sort of like emergency cases. Those are immediately sifted out and responded to by community support. Um, but as far as like we'll do, I think it's 24 hour roll up. We sort of update. You're now a 482 driver, 486 driver. We're kind of like class like that. Your, your Uber rating has changed. Oh. <laughs> I'll come back. Yeah. Sorry. Um, do you do, I mean, Sure. The Twitter. Thing. I think yeah. Anybody who's worked in startups will, if you if you watch the Twitter feed for your company, it's just immediately negative, right? There's a huge amount of selection bias. So do you get an incentive to like say, um, to get the customer We haven't so much on the fly. I know that there have definitely been instances of like genuinely amazing driver behavior. I mean, we've had. Instances. One of my favorite, a Uber Boston driver driving a very pregnant woman uh, somewhere on New Year's Eve, in fact, and the woman starts giving birth in, in the car. The driver immediately hangs the left, hits the Massachusetts General, gets her out of the car, checks her into the hotel, or check the hotel, like the hospital, <laughs> and then waits in the waiting room to figure out if it was a boy or a girl and was like calling the husband. Like, that's incredible. That's an awesome Uber story. Of course, we're going to reward things like that. Um, 
It's part of the sort of average, like, professional, well-kept, like, well-kept in the city. We have a fairly high bar for most of our Uber drivers, so a lot of that will be, it's less about, like, an individual good experience, like, it's just kind of, that's what you expect, right? What we do reward is a lot of guys who are consistently nailing it. You know, like what we, it's, it's easy to have one five-star trip of the night. It's much harder to have 15 in a row, 20 in a row. Um, and so a lot of what we focus on are those sort of consistent best performers. And really what that looks like is weekly aggregate. We'll have sort of top 5% of Uber drivers, top 5% of most improved Uber drivers. Those are sort of the metrics that we tend to most consider. Yeah. When does the driver start getting rated? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So I can repeat. When does when does a driver start getting rated? So this is the the flip side of the driver rating problem. Whenever you ride Uber, you get rated. Uh, and if you want to talk about having a positive bias in driver rate, it's like guys who just push by. Clients are quite, it, it's even more so. Most, if you are just a normal client, you're going to get a five star rating. That's just how it works. Um, which makes it harder if you want to do comparative analysis, but much easier for me to pick out problem clients. Right? If they're all fives, I just have to look for anything not five. And those are sort of the problem cases that we highlight. Um, we take client ratings though very seriously. I mean, there are there are lots of clients where it's not worth our time, it's not worth our business's time, it's not worth the money you could potentially give us to be on the Uber system because, like I was saying, uh, cars and drivers are the lifeblood of Uber. If we have one client who pisses the driver off so much, the other wants to work with us again. From a purely bottom line business perspective. We just lost a lot more money than, than the subsequent 15 trips we were going to take. Um, and, and that's just kind of the nature of the business. That's not to say we value one or more as far as, like, if we have two people who have an issue with each other, I mean, that's a sort of much more tricky situation. But we take both rating systems very seriously. Yeah? How do you handle uh, client feedback exhaustion? So do you force your clients to give feedback, or if you don't, um, so routinely uses the service. Sure. I mean, at the Vancouver BC, we've got a car to go straight system. Every time you get into the car, it asks you, is the car clean? Is there any damage? Sure. At some point, the user always says, no, there's no damage. Yes, it's clean. All the time. <laughs> yep, exactly. And um, some of that uh, client feedback is off. So first of all, we don't force you to do anything besides the star rating. So, Freeform text is usually some of the most rich feedback you get. If it's not empty, that's immediately a pretty good signal that this is something we should pay attention to. Um, the other aspect here is, is, and something that we're also looking at is, if your clients are getting exhausted with how you ask them to rate people, then perhaps your rating system is not well designed. Um, the best example I can give of this, and I can give it because they're great friends of mine, um, is if anybody has ever rated an Airbnb hostel or hotel space, I swear to God, it's like 30 questions, about 25 of which are redundant. Um, and just by the end, I'm like, I don't care, five, 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 five. Yeah. Um, and that sort of leads to the nth degree. Um, the simplest system, if you can imagine, just be thumbs up, thumbs down. And that's actually, we haven't had the ability to, to A-B test that yet. Most of our ratings are pretty much coded, but perhaps a little sneak peek. In the next couple of weeks, you might see, some of you might start to see <laughs> down system, but that's exactly what we're testing. So you can have, well, then you can do a third one, thumbs up, thumbs down, or just the thumbs up is good, right? Like it's all around the one, like for us, when we're, when we're dealing with uh, Uber support, the expectation is it's amazing, right? That's kind of the bar we set with our drivers. And I mean, that sounds a little bit like marketing talk, but that's really it. I mean, like if we're charging you, especially with limos, we're charging you a premium about taxis, we, the customers pay extra, they have the right to be picky, we have the right to hold people to a high bar, that's sort of our internal bottom. We make that, and this is not like an ambush or anything else, right? We started for Uber, it's a great business opportunity, and as part of that, we expect sort of consistently high service. Um, so yeah, so I'm totally okay with people just stuffed up and going to the top, it's good for me. 
Yeah, I just need to figure out like a problem. Like, you're really like you're looking at significance, not necessarily an average behavior. No, I just waved it like yes. Sorry. So you just said that you toward the drivers. Sure. How do you toward them? And then secondly, is there a tier customer? Like the tier customer, like this is a great customer, takes five bucks a day, VIP status. So we have not done. I can have a second one first. We have not done customer tiering yet. Um, operative word in that sentence was yet. Um, it's something we're interested in. I think some of this is uh, Uber is very much a habit-forming product, right? Where you just like once you've sold your car, you sort of get into it. So is the person who spent the most, most you know, valuable customer to us? If you use us for three years, odds are you're going to use us for three years today. So. There, and that's a fairly straightforward data side problem, just kind of something that we haven't really steered the company towards yet. And the first question, um, oh, reward drivers. drivers. Yes, so that's up to usually the business operation team. It's a data problem to figure out who the best drivers are. Um, it's a business problem to figure out how to reward them. Sometimes that's cash, sometimes we'll do like gift certificates or steak dinners. Or, it really varies by market. But, but I mean, we want it to be something that they pay attention to. Oh my. In the back, I will work for it. So I'm curious, it doesn't sound like you reward good drivers with better pickups or anything. Is there a way that you can have transparency to assure the drivers that that kind of thing isn't going on? Sure. So, and that's sort of an interesting philosophical question. Like, is it in my best interest as a businessman to have my best drivers always pick the customers up or the average driver raising them up? I am firmly, um, and that's a non trivial, multifaceted question. I firmly believe the way you're going to succeed, not just three months from now, or even three years from now, is we collectively pick the group up. And I, and I think that's, I, I, that's just, I'm thinking like I'm building Uber into an 80 year company, you know, like it, and not an eight month company or an eight year company. So um, I kind of build that way, but that's, I recognize that that's a little bit personal, you know, that's how I invest in the product. Um, I'm sorry, you have a second question. Oh, transparency to assure drivers. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so drivers can come in, I think we're up to four days a week, so three hours a day, um, and uh, we call it just office hours. We feel every business person on the team. Come in and ask us anything you want. You want to see the last hundred trips, I'll go through it with you. It, and that's kind of the only place in the company where we still automate. You know, like there, it's important that you have somebody we feel anyway that's important to you somebody to sit down, a human being, we're in this together. And we really are in it together, it's a partnership, right? I want, I want you to be happy because I'll be happy. Um, and and that, that's been working well for us. Yeah. Can you talk about your playbook for entering a new market? I mean, in the sense that you find that you need to get a forum, get a purpose of drivers before you get rides, or do you get rides before you get rides? Sure. So we're, we are speaking, or well, I can say, I can speak in broad strokes, but we are way outside of my data science vein. Um, I, knew that, I do know that the mantra supply over demand is true globally. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's or you know, Columbus, Ohio, you, you gotta find the right driver. You gotta find the right technology to help get those drivers going. So how do you get the initial drivers? Good old fashioned leg work and cold call. <laughs> yeah, I've been putting you off for a while. Uh, so, so Google's made uh, some announcements about, about self-driving cars, pilots on the road. Sure. You, you mentioned earlier how that's somewhat in the neighbor's interest and you take an investment from Google. Uh -huh. So what, what is your view on why you have certain have actual, if not mass production, but actual pilots of self-driving uh, delivery vehicles? Um, interesting. So the, nothing specific. I, and that's not even, I'm not being cagey, I just honestly don't know. Um, I can say, generally speaking, given how much uh, pushback and, and sort of fear we generated over doing something as outrageous as adopting GPS in the taxi industry, doing something as off the wall as using a self-driving car with no one on it is, is going to be quite a aggressive and dramatic change. Um, not saying we're not up for it, but, but I imagine there are years of litigation before I would seriously <laughs> consider it. Yeah. Uh, so you're looking to break the driver and use the user from that. Sure. But you're looking to connect to what you do to start collecting data. Mm -hmm. uh, have you guys gotten to how do you what's the word, qualify? How do you qualify the driver based on the data? Sure. 
Yeah. Scoring is a yeah. Exactly. This is a scoring problem. It's a very consummate traditional. <laughs> <laughs> you don't teach racing history. No racing history. I have not. <laughs> That's an interesting aspect. Um, one point of clarification: you say we only rate drivers on customer feedback. We also rate them on sort of the top-down business metrics. So, like how close you were to predicted the high confidence predicted ETA. Um, Let's see what your rejection rate is, cancellation, how many trips you're taking on one of the settings. Those sorts of ones that you can kind of get server side also factor into overall driver quality. It might not be the rating is customer feedback, but sort of quality a step above that includes all of it. I can do like two more questions. Yes. Uh, are there any uh, legal challenges to Uber and how I how you handle it? Any I'm sorry? Legal challenges. Legal yes. Uh, we have in 65 cities, my guess would be we've probably had visits from lawyers with about 60 of them. Uh, and beyond that, I've been asked to not really speak about that in, in engineering features. But uh, I can say people like us, and that generally tends to be reflected in courtrooms. Like the, the populace, the chat, like, they like what we're about. We're helping you guys out. Um, so we've been, been quite successful there, but that's about all I can say. Is there anybody who hasn't had a chance to ask a question? Who wants to ask the last question? Last one. Yeah, I saw the hand go up. Is it possible, probably, to use the lead car as a, in, in Uber platform or in, as a Uber car? I'm sorry, one more time. Is it possible, probably, to use the lead car? To use a lift car? Yeah, lift, VIP, yeah. Sure. Uh, that's an interesting question. I could say, generally speaking, that given the amount of hours that go into vetting a new driver, <laughs> ensuring he, he is the best 20 or 30 percent of, of the driver cohort, given the amount of time that goes into that and what that means for our sort of long-term viability and success of the brand, um, that I would really rather not have anybody but the guys who I'm okay going to pick up my customers. So that's just pure business. Cool. Well, uh, that's about all I can do up here. I'll be hanging out here for about another 30, 45 minutes.